Next up, we have uh, Dr. Christian Cachin, who is a cryptographer and computer scientist at IBM Research. Christian. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about Hyperledger Fabric as a platform for uh, distributed trust. In fact, for my background, I'm a cryptographer. I've done research in cryptographic protocols for almost 20 years at IBM Research. IBM Research is uh, here in Zurich, located halfway between Zurich and uh, Zug, so halfway between the traditional finance world and the excitement of the startup world here at the Crypto Valley. And uh, in much of the same spirit, we at IBM Research were also uh, bridging between uh, the traditional enterprise finance world that has been running IBM computers since there were computers and the modern uh, distributed decentralized world of blockchains. Yeah, I'm not often talking in the uh, CEO track here, because our CEO is uh, leading an, an enterprise of 350,000 people. Um, but in that sense, I will still... Um, I I'll talk about the, uh, the way to get this, uh, the technology out into the uh, real life. Before we start with Hyperledger Fabric, I would like to share some thoughts about how to design and engineer systems. How the planes that brought some of you here, how the trains that brought us here, and the cars, how they are made safe and how they are built. Because it's not a coincidence that these systems uh, work so well. They don't come out of nowhere. In fact, they are built based on a sound body of knowledge. How do we build a mechanical system? Um, there is, of course, analytics, an analytical theory that this explains how the world works, how mechanics work. Um, but there also has to be validation, empirical validation of your concepts uh, through experiments. Yeah? And even if an experiment looks as badly as the Tacoma, Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster in the 1940s, it's valuable to learn things from empirical uh, uh, experiments in, in the real life. And if you are a mechanical engineer, usually you make your system safer by adding, by doubling the weight or by adding another layer of steel or something like this. Now, this is not always possible in the crypto space. How do we design drugs? This is a similar development. We rely on scientific insight and discoveries about the real world, how things work. But then we need to turn this around into <laughs> systems, into drugs that work that are actually safe to use. And for this, we need also empirical validation. And this is a part of science. Now, medicine has gone beyond uh, snake oil. That was uh, another way where, where people proposed cure-alls in the late 19th century, because there was no corresponding certification and validation of the, of, of the standards and the drugs. And in that sense, um, medicine has already gone and come along a long way. Um, how do we design crypto systems? After about several hundred years or even thousands of years of uh, government monopolies in secret dark chambers or black chambers where cryptography was practiced, it has become a modern science nowadays, since about 40 years, um, where mathematical arguments, proofs, and sophisticated designs and discussions about designs uh, prevail. But interestingly, the history of cryptography also has its uh, snake oil time in the sense of uh, that in the late 90s, when the internet boom was uh, in its full, full uh, flux, there was a list of frequently asked questions about cryptographic snake oil software because there were so many vendors who just proposed their own unbreakable crypto system that was so much better than any other crypto system. But for experts, it was easy to spot why it did work out. And in fact, Bruce Schneier, who is an authority on this kind of thing, started to collect a blog and uh, in a blog post, in blog posts, started to collect many of those examples. And as you can see, the date on the website there, it's a while ago. So how do we design a blockchain? And I guess you know the answer. 
um, that I'm going to give you. But I also hear that some of you want to say, well, Satoshi's white paper, it dropped from the sky, and it was right from the start, and it started the revolution. However, Bitcoin is not a technology that came out of nowhere. It actually has a huge academic pedigree of methods and techniques that were developed by cryptographers in the 90s. It is that Bitcoin showed how to actually use them, and it did use them, but the safety or security of Bitcoin was shown first empirically, because initially people wouldn't really trust it. It's only much later that scientific proofs were constructed for the security of, of uh, the protocol underlying Bitcoin. And so I want to, just before we go into uh, Hyperledger Fabric and consortium blockchains versus other blockchains, I would like to just remind you that blockchains should also be constructed according to sound engineering principles, according to standards, according to broad validation of protocols, to scientific understanding, and to assumptions where we have those assumptions. Because the security system is kind of difficult to validate. You will not even see when it fails, yeah? It's just that your money will be gone from the day or your secrets are going to be exposed. And so in that sense, blockchains are like crypto systems. You can't really design your own system and be secure or sure that it's so much better than that it actually works and it's so much better than other people's systems just because you think it's so much better. You need an argument that uh, should convince you and also your uh, users of why the system is secure under certain assumptions. And of course, you have to talk about the assumptions that uh, underlie the system. Because if the system fails, it only fails once and it's too late. And as I said already, there are multiple ways to achieve security. And to quote Schneier again from the 1999 website, the problem with bad security is that it, just, it looks just like good security. You can't tell the difference by looking at the product. You have to look inside. So let's look inside a bit. Uh, before we go into this, there is a uh, paper published uh, in a scientific conference where some of that reasoning is, is collected and some of the consortium consensus protocols are uh, looked at under this uh, viewpoint. Blockchain consensus protocols that you are certainly familiar with, they, are, they come in two, uh, in two families. Yeah? Yeah. There are the so-called permissionless protocols or decentralized blockchains where everyone can participate. Originally, the vision of Bitcoin was that one CPU had one vote, as if, was, as if every user had only one CPU. Now it's turned into a huge uh, mining business that uh, keeps the Bitcoin blockchain and all the other proof-of-work blockchains uh, secure. And indeed, you invest work to vote in those systems and to govern the system as well. And if you can't reach consensus, well then, what happens more recently is that these blockchains split. Yeah. Um, it's not based on the traditional voting protocols. Because it has this very interesting feature that everyone can participate. So in that sense, it survives uh, censorship. That was all an original goal, such that uh, nobody could be there to turn off the system. And it scales. The protocols themselves have the nice feature that they scale to thousands of nodes, that uh, they are uh, resilient to uh, particular uh, influence of in individual nodes. But on the other hand, as a drawback, they will take minutes, seconds to minutes, in order to make to reach a decision in, in a consensus instance. And that is actually uh, a drawback for your uh, blockchain if you want to scale it. It also requires a huge energy investment because the interest in the system that's usually coupled with a coin has brought prices up such that many people are interested in, in uh, contributing to it. And so today, a, a recent estimate that I checked was that the Bitcoin blockchain alone consumed more, like, more electricity than all of Switzerland, and uh, it's only rising. I mean, the Bitcoin en energy consumption. So these protocols are, on the one hand, they're usually coupled to cryptocurrencies. Um, 
they are contrasted with the traditional, more traditional Byzantine fault-tolerant protocols that go under this name because they were studied in computer science as abstract items for decades, uh, where voting is based on votes by nodes, who in, this, uh, in the internet world, they need an, uh, a public key that identifies them. So in blockchain world, we usually talk about a defined group of validators that uh, makes these decisions. Um, and uh, they, these protocols follow the established design principles that we have uh, developed uh, in, the, in the literature on distributed systems and, cryptos and cryptography. Many variations of this thing is possible because some people object to those systems that there is one person who set this all up. This is not the case. It's just that the incentive to participate has to be resolved differently, has to be organized differently, instead of a coin that is uh, inherent in the other protocols here. Um, it's usually a more traditional organization that sets this up. But once such a system runs, you can change your influence through the protocol, you can change the group, you can admit new members, you can kick out members, just like a group in real life would do. These protocols have also been studied, uh, as I said, for a long time, and it's instructive to look at the research history of those, uh, of such protocols. In the 80s, from the 80s until about 2000, there were lots of theory papers on the problem but no implementations whatsoever. The only theoreticians looked at this, at this problem. Um, some systems made it to the real world, but not the ones that tolerated actual attacks. Only those protocols where um, crashes would be tolerated. Paxos is uh, the name of such a protocol. And then in, from about 2000 till 2010, there was a lot of research in the computer science systems departments where people built such systems, tested them out, but never exposed them to the real life, never exposed them uh, in the wild. Because whenever we, wherever we went, and I was part of this too, uh, people wouldn't have an application for those uh, systems. Yeah. And uh, so we stopped developing this until a few years ago when the blockchain came along, and we now found out that people were actually interested in this security assumption. And along the way, here is a link to a, a picture of a textbook that I have contributed to as well, where we describe such protocols, if in case you want to know more. Now, these protocols, as you probably know also, they are very well understood from the theoretical viewpoint. Also, they can reach uh, thousands of transactions per second, even in wide area networks. And as an important feature that they have, certainly for uh, uh, enterprise applications is that the decisions that the protocol reaches, they are final. We'll never have to revert this if the miners lose interest in your blockchain. And it can also not be that somebody mounts uh, as easily as in other, some anonymous entity mounts a 51% attack on your blockchain like this. On the other hand, the known drawbacks of these protocols are that they will not run among thousands of nodes who have an influence. Yeah? But then contrast this with the Bitcoin network where a few big mining pools uh, are, are uh, ruling today. This is actually not so much of a different uh, perspective. Now, I will talk more about Hyperledger and Hyperledger Fabric. Hyperledger is a consortium, or actually it's a, it's a project organized by the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation is, of course, responsible for Linux the biggest open source uh, project in the world. Hyperledger was founded about three years ago, more than three years ago, by the Linux Foundation, no, in two and a half years ago, to focus on enterprise business, uh, enterprise applications of uh, blockchain. And Hyperledger Fabric is a particular platform within, developed within the Hyperledger project. There are more than one such platforms uh, being built and developed by Hyperledger. In fact, there are five frameworks and uh, five tools at this time that are all developed by uh, Hyperledger, including Fabric, Sawtooth, Iroha, Indie that you heard before in the identity track, in the identity session, which uh, concentrates on decentralized identity. And here are all the members of the Hyperledger project, but which is to say that these are companies who sponsor the governance, but the development is really open source, and it's like all the other open source projects, there are some people who are maintainers, and they are actually making the real decisions. So Hyperledger Fabric 
to come to this now, that's one of the enterprise blockchain platforms. It's a distributed ledger framework for blockchains. Initially, uh, it was developed, it was started to be developed at IBM. And also we in, in Zurich, we made uh, key decisions for this. We have been sort of in the, driving seat, in the driver's seat for this for several years now because we have expertise in, in the Zurich Research Lab on cryptographic protocols, consensus protocols, and security architectures. You can find technical details in a paper that's cited here or on the website in the documentations. Uh, suffice it to say that Fabric is a uh, platform for running smart contracts for enterprise applications, and it does not have a coin. The design feature of Fabric is that it departs in a radical way from how existing blockchain platforms and many other such systems are built. Traditionally, if you go to the, to the class and if you also read the textbook on how to build consensus among mistrusting nodes in a distributed system, you will hear that, oh, we need a protocol to order the requests, to sort the transactions. And then, once this protocol has decided on this order, each individual node or peer in the system will execute the transactions individually. This requires, of course, that transactions are deterministic. And if you heard about that from Ethereum, it is indeed the case that this shows this must be. And then each peer updates the state individually on its own. And this is a design principle that had been used from the 90s, 90s onwards. And also our first version of Fabric used this design. And here's a picture of how this looks like. Mainly, every single peer runs every smart contract and participates in the protocol at the same time. That, of course, has certain limitations in the sense that if somebody uh, runs a transaction on this blockchain and it takes you 10 milliseconds to execute such a transaction, then all the peers will have to execute this and your blockchain will not deliver more than 100 transactions per second because, after all, you have to run each transaction for 10 milliseconds and there are not more milliseconds uh, uh, available. And so this is the design that, most, that all other systems use so far. And in Fabric now, we've recognized that not only the replication to all nodes was a limiting factor, the scalability was a limiting factor, um, also the fact that the, the operations had to be deterministic. That's a problem that uh, we saw in many uh, cases because we had a protocol, we had a PBFD implementation, a BFD consensus protocol implementation, and then our users told us, you have a bug in consensus. Yeah, we have a fork, we have a state that diverged, yeah. And every single time we went back and asked, it turned out that they had programmed their smart contract using some non-deterministic programming language constructs, such as iterating over some programming language construct. So it's hard to get programs right deterministically. And another an item here is that the trust model is sort of not flexible enough because you have all nodes more or less in the same weight, all the nodes have the same weight on endorsing and, and validating the correctness of transactions as they have in the consensus protocol. And that doesn't have to be, because you can have a smart contract that is more important for some nodes and another one that's more important for other nodes. And so we changed this to the different architecture that you see in Fabric V1, and it's described also in the, in the research uh, reports that I pointed to, where we first execute the transactions in, of a particular smart code only on those nodes that are relevant for this smart contract. So you can define that a certain smart contract has to be endorsed, that's how we call it, has to be endorsed only by a certain subset of the nodes. And the other nodes, they will get all the state updates, but they are not responsible for endorsing transactions. And once we have executed the transactions, the, the non-deterministic ones will have filtered out themselves automatically in a certain way because they couldn't be properly endorsed if the endorsers couldn't agree on what the state was. We are ordering through the consensus protocol only a static representation of the output of this uh, execution. In a way, we are just sending the effects to the stored data as a database jargon. In the database jargon, this is called a read set and a write set. And indeed, this uses certain uh, ideas from replicated databases. And then after this uh, has been 
these transactions have been ordered, there is a simple validation step that can, that's much faster than running the smart contract transactions that every node, every peer in the system executes. So that's how the picture looks like now for the database for this, uh, uh, sorry, for the, for the fabric blockchain with selective endorsement by peers that are defined. Uh, for the blue smart contract, only the nodes, the peers that run the blue smart contract are re responsible for endorsing it. And the ordering itself is taken care of by a separate ordering service that's completely stateless and agnostic to the blockchain, but again gives you the flexibility of defining a different uh, trust model. Now, yeah, I don't really want to talk about all these details, but it's clear that if you invoke a transaction, you first go to these endorsers. The endorsers compute the outcome of the transaction, which is speculative at the moment. Then it's going to be ordered by the consensus protocol. And if somebody wanted to spend two coins in different ways as a double spending, then the mechanics of the conflict checking in the infrastructure will prevent this. Consensus, as I said, is modular, so we have a couple of different implementations of consensus protocols. The easiest one is called Solo Order, which we use for development, but actually the one that's in production now is a crash-tolerant uh, streaming platform. We have a research prototype with a BFT platform, and we are currently developing a PBFT-based variation to replace uh, the research prototype for uh, for ordering, so now we get to tolerate malicious insiders in the blockchain there. Here's a picture uh, for on performance that we uh, reached in an experiment across several data centers, uh, varying the number of peers uh, up to about 100, and the lines that uh, you can see where the, um, where the performance sort of uh, decreases, the throughput decreases from about 3,000 transactions per second to 2,000, this, uh, are, uh, this is an experiment that ran over a couple of different data centers. The other one where the performance remained, performance remained linear, uh, that was done in the same data center with a Bitcoin-like workload of a simple cryptocurrency. Now, Fabric has, has been deployed in many uh, systems already, has been, available, has been made available as a blockchain, as a service, not only on IBM's cloud, but on Amazon's cloud, Microsoft's cloud, uh, for Oracle's and any other cloud I, I mention here, which gives us uh, a good uh, feeling if your competitors run another platform uh, on, on their clouds. It has also been at the core of many new business ventures that were started, such as the Consortium on uh, trade, uh, Global Trade, Digitalization and Blockchain, uh, by IBM and Maersk, the Danish uh, shipping company, where the idea would be that uh, exporters, uh, terminals, ports, shippers would uh, connect their data and uh, interact through a blockchain. Of course, it's also available on the IBM cloud, and here's some details on what's running in terms of Hyperledger Fabric on the IBM cloud. The IBM blockchain platform is an integrated data, an integrated blockchain service platform. It combines uh, combines a development tool called Hyperledger Composer, which is also nicely works with Hyperledger Fabric uh, smart contracts. And the cloud platform itself provides enterprise, secur enterprise security features that you want actually to use to, to secure your, your money, such as hardware, secure module, hardware security modules to guard private keys. This is technology that's available, among others, on IBM Linux One uh, servers that are very well known already to power traditional banking infrastructures. Now, of course, you can object to the blockchain as a service model and say, well, if blockchain runs on a cloud service provider, isn't this cloud service provider a centralized, uh, trusted party? And to some extent, you're right, but to another extent, you can wonder whether this cloud service provider not only supplies electricity to your computers, but now just supplies compute cycles to your computations, in the sense that the cloud service provider just supplies the cycles, yeah, and it has no interest whatsoever to uh, disrupt the whole system, yeah. And that's new forms that stand between the extreme of totally decentralized and centralized systems that we have seen in the past. Current research directions, very briefly, what are we working on in the lab now? Uh, we are extending 
and building and developing mechanisms for more privacy to add uh, parts where state can be stored but doesn't have to be shared as uniformly as it was uh, as I explained before. We're also building libraries uh, incorporating zero knowledge proofs for asset transfer such that you can trade with assets on a hyperledger fabric blockchain and have as much privacy guarantees as the Zcash cryptocurrency would have. And the mechanisms there are similar, but not as expensive. And also, as you heard earlier, we are building a lot of tools for uh, anonymous credentials, authentication that uh, we are building in there. And last but not least, we're also experimenting with uh, secure hardware technology in Terraform in the kind of Intel SGX, where we are running smart contracts, Hyperledger Fabric, within an Intel SGX enclave to guard privacy. Uh, secrets. Yeah, so I'd like to conclude mentioning again that blockchain is about distributing trust on the internet. Hyperledger Fabric includes a lot of uh, sound engineering principles that I hope to convince, have to convince you that this is a better way to build a system than uh, something you don't really understand. Hyperledger Fabric is currently the most advanced uh, enterprise blockchain platform out there, and it's driven by innovations uh, from IBM Research. Here are some links. We're also supported in a European Union research by, with other academic colleagues. Here are some links uh, that you can look up more. And uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>